In the last video, I showed that instead of rotating a 3D vector with a 3 by 3 rotation matrix, we can instead rotate it using a double-sided transformation. We rewrite the vector as a 2 by 2 matrix called a Pauli vector and multiply it on either side with an SU2 matrix on the left and the Hermitian conjugate of that SU2 matrix on the right. Some viewers pointed out this looks similar to rotating vectors with quaternions, which also involves a double-sided transformation, with a unit quaternion Q on the left, and that quaternion's conjugate Q star on the right. These look even more similar if we rewrite the SU2 matrices using half-angle trig functions and the sigma matrices and rewrites the quaternion Q using half-angle trig functions and IJK. It turns out that the unit quaternions are mathematically equivalent to SU2 matrices, and in this video I'm going to show how. First, let's review quaternions. Hopefully you know that the imaginary number i is defined such that i squared equals negative 1. This allows us to write complex numbers of the form a plus b i, where a and b are real coefficients. Quaternions are like an extension of the complex numbers where we have three imaginary units, i, j, and k, each of which squares to negative 1. We can use these to write quaternions, which have the form a plus b i plus c j plus d k where a, b, c, d are all real coefficients. Now, with quaternions, it's not enough to know that the imaginary units square to minus 1. We also need to know how they multiply with each other. The standard multiplication rules are i times j equals k, j times k equals i, and k times i equals j. We can visualize these multiplication rules by following the arrows on this circle. For example, if we do i times j, we follow the arrows to get k. If the multiplication goes against the arrows, we get a negative sign. For example, j times i equals negative k. This gives us an important property. The quaternion imaginary units are anti-commutative. This means that if we swap the order of multiplication of any two different imaginary units, we get a negative sign in front. So i times j equals negative j times i, and so on. We can also summarize the quaternion multiplication rules using this table. However, we can derive this entire table from just four simple formulas. The first three formulas tell us that i, j, and k all square to negative 1. And the final formula tells us that i times j times k equals negative 1. All possible multiplications can be derived from these four rules. For example, if we take the last formula and multiply both sides by k on the right, since k squared equals negative 1, we can derive i times j equals k. I should also mention the idea of a quaternion's conjugate q star. Given some quaternion q, we get the conjugate q star by switching the signs of the imaginary units i, j, k. If we multiply q by q star, we get 16 terms where only the diagonal terms are non-zero. So we get a squared plus b squared plus c squared plus d squared, which is the squared length of the quaternion. We say that q star over the squared length of q is the inverse of q, denoted q to the negative 1. This is because q times q inverse gives us 1. Now let's review the sigma matrices and how they lead to SU2 matrices. We already introduced the sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z matrices in the last video. The i in the sigma y matrix is the complex number i that squares to negative 1. We already saw these matrices all square to the identity matrix, which I'm denoting with this fancy number 1. We also know that they anti-commute with each other, so when we swap the order of any two different sigma matrices in a product, we get a negative sign in front. So the sigma matrices look a bit like the quaternion imaginary units, 
They anti-commute just like IJK, but they square to positive 1 instead of squaring to negative 1. Here's the key to linking the sigmas with IJK. A single sigma matrix will square to plus 1, but a pair of different sigma matrices will square to negative 1. For example, if we take sigma x times sigma y and square it, we get the sigmas x, y, x, y. If we flip the middle two sigmas, we pick up a negative sign, which we can bring out to the front. We're left with sigma x squared and sigma y squared, which both go to the identity matrix. So we end up with the negative of the identity matrix. We can use a similar proof to show that any pair of different sigmas squares to the negative identity matrix. It also turns out that these pairs of sigma matrices also anti-commute with one another. We can show this just by swapping the individual sigmas step by step, and we end up with a negative sign in front. So it seems like the quaternion imaginary units i, j, k might somehow be related to pairs of sigma matrices, and that's exactly right. Here's the correspondence between them. There's an easy way to remember this. The quaternion imaginary i is sort of like the x-axis, and this is matched with negative sigma y times sigma z, which is sort of like the yz plane, which is perpendicular to the x-axis. Similarly, j is like the y-axis, associated with the perpendicular zx plane, and k is like the z-axis, associated with the xy plane. To prove this equivalence, we need to establish the fundamental properties of quaternions, that each of i, j, k square to negative 1, and that i times j times k equals negative 1. We've already shown that these pairs of sigma matrices square to the negative identity, and the fact that we've added a negative sign in front doesn't change this result, since negative 1 squares to plus 1. Next, we need to show the equivalent of i times j times k equals negative 1. If we replace i, j, k with our negative sigma pairs, we can multiply all three negative signs into a single negative sign out in front. The inner pairs of sigma z's and sigma x's go to 1, and the remaining pairs of sigma y's also goes to 1, so we get negative 1 as desired. So these negative sigma pairs are completely mathematically equivalent to the quaternion imaginary units. In mathematical terms, we say they are isomorphic. So how does this fit into rotating vectors? When rotating with quaternions, we can write a vector v by replacing the x, y, z basis vectors with i, j, and k. So we get a quaternion with only pure imaginary parts and no real part. We rotate V with a double-sided transformation involving a unit quaternion Q, which is a quaternion with length 1. The real part of Q is cosine theta over 2, and the imaginary part is sine theta over 2 times the axis of rotation. For example, if we want to rotate counterclockwise around the z-axis, we set the axis of rotation to K. For the Q star on the right, we take the quaternion's conjugate, which means reversing the signs of the imaginary units i, j, k. Here's a worked example of rotating the vector k around the j axis by an angle theta. Using some basic trig identities, we end up with some vector that lives in the i, k plane, rotating from the starting k axis by an angle theta. You might also see this formula written with q on the left and q inverse on the right. This formula works if q is not normalized and has a length not equal to 1. The denominator for q inverse forces both q's to have length 1. If we want to do rotations with the sigma matrices instead, we rewrite a vector v by replacing the x, y, z basis vectors with sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z. And this gives us our Pauli vector. The double-sided transformation uses a matrix u, which equals cosine theta over 2 times the identity matrix, 
minus sine theta over two times the plane of rotation. For example, if we want to rotate in the yz plane in the direction taking y to z, we use sigma y times sigma z. For the matrix on the right half of the double-sided transformation, we take the complex conjugate transpose of u, also called the Hermitian conjugate of u, denoted with the dagger symbol. Since the sigma matrices are Hermitian and equal to their own daggers, the dagger applied to a pair of them just swaps their order, which is the same thing as introducing a negative sign. So this is just the U matrix, but with the rotation angle working in the opposite direction. So it's really U inverse. So the dagger is basically playing the same role as the quaternion conjugate we saw earlier. So it's really U inverse. Since u dagger equals u inverse, we call u a unitary matrix. Another thing to note is that multiplying u by an overall phase factor e to the i phi will not change the rotation results, since complex phase factors will cancel out. As I showed in the last video, this allows us to set the determinant of u to any complex number of magnitude 1 that we like. So we set the determinant of u to be plus 1 by convention, making it a special unitary matrix SU2. Here's an example of rotating the vector sigma z in the zx plane. The math works out in a similar way to the example we saw earlier with quaternions. So the quaternion rotation formula is written in terms of a rotation axis and the SU2 rotation formula with the sigmas is written in terms of a rotation plane. But both formulas are equivalent, related by this equivalence. So both unit quaternions and the SU2 matrices give us a way of rotating 3D vectors using double-sided transformations. These are both describing a more general concept called a spin group. In particular, these are two different ways of describing spin 3, the spin group of three-dimensional space. Spin 3 is what we call the double cover of the rotation group SO3. I mentioned before that we normally rotate 3D vectors using 3x3 three three matrices called SO3 matrices. For every SO3 matrix R, there are two quaternions that do the same rotation. If Q is a quaternion that does the same rotation as R, then negative Q will do the same rotation, since the pair of minus signs will cancel out in the double-sided transformation. The same reasoning applies to SU2 matrices. For a given SO3 matrix R, there are two SU2 matrices, plus U and minus U, that will perform the same rotation. So the unit quaternions or equivalently, the SU2 matrices are considered the double cover of SO3 rotation matrices, because there are two members that will do the same rotation for any given rotation R. If we want to learn to build the higher dimensional versions of the quaternions that do rotations in 4, 5, 6, and generally n dimensions, we need to learn how to build the spin n group. We'll do this later in the video series when we discuss Clifford algebras, also called geometric algebras. In the next video, I'll show that we can factor a Pauli vector into a pair of Pauli spinners, where each one transforms with a single SU2 matrix. So basically, we can think of vectors as objects that transform with a pair of quaternions and we can think of spinners as objects that transform with a single quaternion.